views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, I am Jose Higuera, Deputy Director of the Mexican Studies Institute at CUNY. Welcome to one more edition of the Mexican Studies Oral History Project. Today, we come to you from the offices of Richard Carranza, New York City Schools Chancellor of the New York City Department of Education. Chancellor Carranza, thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure, and thank you for coming to Tweed Courthouse. Thank you. And also, thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule. We know that you're very busy. So, we want to start by asking you, what does it mean for you to be leading the, uh, the DOE? Well, it's for me something that uh, it's truly the American dream. I mean, I was an English language learner. I only spoke Spanish when I started school as a kindergartner in Tucson. Uh, and for me to eventually become a teacher, then a principal, and then a, a, super, a superintendent, and now to be leading the largest school system in America, uh, is truly the power of what a public school education can do. Uh, so for me, it's a, big, uh, it's a big honor for me to be in this position. Uh, but along with that big honor, it also means that there's a big responsibility. And that means that I want to make sure that uh, during my chancellorship that we are talking about the issues that are important to all residents of New York City. And when you consider that 70% of the 1.1 million students in New York City's public schools are black or Latino, then I want to make sure that those issues and those issues of concern for those communities are lifted as well. Uh, so when you hear me talk about equity, I'm talking about all students, but particularly students in historically underserved communities and historically underserved uh, student groups. Um, and then what it means for me as well is that it's not lost upon me that in the public school um, environment, if you will, uh, New York City being the biggest school system in America, that we have a certain voice and a certain role to play as it pertains to these issues. So the ability to be able to lead the system and in some respects shape broader national conversations is also something that I don't want to miss the opportunity to be sure that we're really clear about what we feel. So all of those things go into the fact that I'm very proud uh, to be the chancellor, but I also carry with me every day a, a, a huge level of responsibility. Yes. And before we go into your trajectory and how you got here, um, can you tell us where did you grow up? How was your childhood a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so I'm uh, the second generation son of uh, Mexican immigrants. Uh, uh, so my parents were born in the United States, my brother and I were born in the United States, but it's interesting because in Tucson, Arizona, where I was born and raised, uh, our family traces their lineage back for generations, and uh, they were miners and they were farmers, uh, and uh, such that, you know, my grandparents, although they're considered to be immigrants to the United States, my grandparents never, never crossed the border. The border crossed them yes. in Mexico. So. For us, there was a very deep uh, tie to the land. Um, but I grew up, born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Went to the public schools in Tucson. As I've mentioned, I was an English language learner. My parents were both bilingual. They spoke English and Spanish and, and were fully bilingual, but they made the conscious choice that uh, my brother and I would only know Spanish. They only taught us Spanish and that the public schools would teach us English and that we would become bilingual. So for us, uh, there's a very, very big um, love for the public school systems because they did do that for us. So went through all of my public school education in the public schools in Tucson, went to the university there, the University of Arizona, bear down, go Wildcats, um, where I got my teaching credential and then went back and taught in the same high school that I graduated from as a bilingual teacher. Eventually I became an assistant principal, a principal. Then I moved to Las Vegas, Nevada as a high school principal. Uh, eventually becoming a region superintendent in Las Vegas. Uh, at the time, Las Vegas was the fifth largest school system in America. Uh, from there, I was hired as the deputy superintendent for instruction, innovation, and social justice 
How's that for a title? Mm -hmm. uh, in San Francisco, California, uh, and I went to San Francisco. And at the time, San Francisco was about 60,000 students, not as big as Las Vegas, but because it, it was one of those media centers, because it's a world trading center, it had a very, very high profile in San Francisco. Stayed there about seven years and did, I've, I'm very proud of the work we did in San Francisco. Eventually I became superintendent of the San Francisco Unified School District for four years. And then from there I was recruited to go to Houston. And Houston at the time was uh, the largest school district in Texas. It was the seventh largest school district in America uh, and was in Houston for 18 months. But uh, during a very difficult time, uh, Hurricane Harvey hit. Uh, so really had to help lead the school system out from that tragic event in the, in the city. And we did, we did it in, in record time while um, New Orleans uh, it took about six months to recover from Hurricane uh, Katrina. Uh, for public schools to open in, in uh, Houston, we did it in two weeks. So that had a big impact in helping the community to start to recover. So I'm very proud of that work. But while in Houston, I was then uh, recruited and, and approached about becoming chancellor in New York City. And once I went through the process and had the conversation, pues me vine. I came to New York City uh, and have been very proud to work for this mayor and for the children of New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Um, and like I said, I've been here now over a year and really, really excited. Great. And, and, and did you always think you would be a teacher? Was it always ingrained in you that you wanted to be in teaching? You know, I think I intrinsically knew that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as a youngster, you, you start developing all kinds of different uh, interests. So when I graduated from high school, uh, I went and I studied, uh, my major was engineering. I thought I was going to be an engineer. Um, and over the course of my first two years at the university, I started realizing that, you know, I was a, I was a, a gigging mariachi. In other words, uh, you know, I was a working mariachi. That's how I, I paid the bills. Uh, and, but I was giving guitar lessons as well. And I realized that I would much prefer to go give the guitar lesson mm -hmm. than go study engineering in the, in the library. And, and it was a process for me to come to terms with the fact that, no, I really want to be a teacher. Uh, so I think I came to it not as quickly as I should have, mm -hmm. but naturally uh, it, I found my passion and never looked back once I realized I wanted to be a teacher. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing this part of your story, Chancellor. Let's take a short break. And we will be back shortly to the Mexican Studies Oral History Project.
Welcome back to the Mexican Studies Oral History Project. If you're just joining us, today we're talking to Richard Carranza, the New York City Schools Chancellor of the DOE. Chancellor, so we know that uh, mariachi is very important for your music in general. So did you, when you were teaching, uh, did you use music uh, in your classroom? Uh, how do you feel that music plays a part in education? Well, I think music is critically important. I think the fine arts, the arts, um, should be considered as part of the core instructional curriculum in, in a school. We wouldn't think of having school without teaching English or teaching math. I think we shouldn't think of school without having some kind of an arts component. So for me, yes, absolutely, I used music in, in my classrooms. I was a bilingual social studies teacher. That's, that was what my training was, and that's what I majored in. <clears throat> I took some music courses along the way so I could teach music, and then obviously I was a performer. Um, but students at my high school actually approached me and wanted to start a mariachi program, so we started a mariachi program. I wrote the curriculum, the first adopted mariachi curriculum in a public school in America. Uh, and we created the program. Um, uh, almost 30 years later, that program is still in existence in, in Tucson, uh, doing very well with multiple generations now of, of students. But that became then the genesis for many students to take up an instrument, to sing in the choir, to play in the band. So the student that wanted to be Vicente Fernandez mm -hmm. and wanted to sing in the mariachi, but that's, that's great, but you should be in the choir mm -hmm. so you'd learn how to do that properly and then the choir would grow. Uh, the student that wanted to play violin in the mariachi, absolutely, but you should also be in the orchestra so you learn proper technique and then you can play other forms of music. So very proud of how I've, I've uh, always supported music, but proud of what music has done for for many of my students. That's great. And do you play an instrument? or? I do. In, in the mariachi world, you never say that you play the instrument because that connotes a level of uh, mastery. So we say, yo cargo. Mm. I, I carry the guitar, the vihuela, the guitarron, wow. uh, violin. And then in the marching band, I played the cargaba, el saxophone, the saxophone. That's great. And this might, might be a little bit too much asking, but would you be able to sing just a short uh, something about mariachi, uh, a song that you like, a cappella. A cappella, pues, uh, man, there's a lot of songs. Uh, pues a cappella, ahí les va una canción de José Alfredo Jiménez, una favorita de todos. Yo sé bien que estoy afuera, pero el día que yo me muera, sé que tendrás que llorar. Dirás que no me quisiste, pero vas a estar muy triste. Y así te vas a quedar con dinero y sin dinero. Hago siempre lo que quiero y mi palabra es la ley. No tengo trono ni reina ni nadie quien me comprenda, pero sigo siendo el rey. That was great. Thank you so much, Chancellor, for Thank sharing you. this with. And now. Coming back to education, sure. um, so you mentioned a little bit about San Francisco and also uh, Houston. So what do you see as the main difference, differences or significant differences between those systems and the New York City school system? Well, I think the obvious difference is that New York City is so much larger. Uh, the, the next closest school system in size to New York City is Los Angeles Unified. Uh, and they're about 650,000 students and we're 1.1 million, so we're almost double the size. So there's no comparison, we're just much bigger. And the size and the geographic distribution of all of our students make it so that it's a, it's a big system and that has its own challenges uh, to it. It's, it's some advantages, but its own challenges. Uh, that being said, the differences also are in that uh, you know, in the state of New York and in New York City, the city of New York has invested so many of its local resources in very innovative progressive programming. For example, we have universal pre-K. That doesn't exist anywhere else in, in the country where every four-year-old has an opportunity to go to pre-K for free. Uh, that not being enough, we've also started adding 3K programs, so three-year-olds can start going to school for free. So in places across the country where there's not even full-day kindergarten, in New York City, we've added two full grades to the public school experience. That's a game changer. That doesn't exist in many other places, anywhere else in, in the country. Um, I think the other thing that's really 
different in New York City is that we have um, very passionate and talented people in our school system, but the advocacy community, the community-based organizations uh, in New York City are at a level that I've never experienced anywhere else, just the level of knowledge, the level of passion. And then one of the things that I love about New York City that I think is one of our strengths in New York City is the diversity of people. Um, obviously, la, la, la comunidad mexicana is strong and vibrant and growing by leaps and bounds, but we have a strong Puerto Rican population, uh, Dominicanos, um, Peruanos, Bolivianos, uh, Salvadoreños. I get in trouble once I start naming everybody because you never name everybody, right? But that richness that we have here in New York City is unlike uh, anything I've experienced anywhere else. Those are just some of the things that are different in New York City. That's great. Thank you so much. And Chancellor Carranza, do you see any challenges specifically to the Mexican community here in New York City? Well, I think there's a, there's a mega challenge to the Mexican community, Mexican-American community in the United States, and that's the current administration in the executive branch, uh, where we've been targeted, we've been painted with one big brush, and it's been a very negative brush. So I think that um, everywhere that I've been since this administration started, and it was in Texas and now here in New York, you know, there's a certain level of trauma that has affected our community where, you know, students are painted with this brush, where families and immigrant communities are being targeted, and we know that there's uh, enforcement uh, of uh, immigration enforcement that is targeting uh, certain communities. And I think those negative messages that get promulgated on a daily basis that our children hear um, is very, very, very uh, damaging to our kids. So that's, I think, a challenge nationwide, but in particular it, ha it happens here in New York City as well. I think it's also important that as we strive to provide services to students, uh, especially Mexicanos, uh, recent immigrants who are learning English, we want to be able to do that in a much more enlightened way so that uh, the perception isn't that if you only speak Spanish, you get labeled an English language learner as if you have to learn English to have value as a student in the system. We've changed our classification. We don't call students English language learners. We call them multilingual learners. Why? Because yet, yet tienen la mitad de, de, de ser bilingüe. They're already halfway there to being bilingual. Mm -hmm. So as they learn English, they become bilingual students and they're multilingual learners. But to be able to do that in an enlightened way, which doesn't subtract opportunities or subtract different kinds of courses of study uh, is really important because students have to continue to develop their first language while they learn a second language. Uh, and then the third thing that I would say is, is a challenge for us, uh, the, the Mexican, Mexican-American community in New York City, is to really claim um, the community's rightful place in every aspect of the city, elected offices, uh, representation, in business and in industry um, to make sure that our students have strong academic options, that our Mexican, Mexican-American communities here in New York City have a strong sense of who they are and their proud history. And more importantly, not only do we have a proud history siendo Mexicanos, but we also have a proud history in terms of how we have contributed to this incredible system of government we call America. That's really important, especially in light of some of the negative, um, some of the negative messages that are being promulgated currently in the current administration. Thank you. Let's take a short break, and we will be back shortly to the Mexican Studies Oral History Project. Welcome back to the Mexican Studies Oral History Project. If you're just joining us, today we're talking to Richard Carranza, the New York City Schools Chancellor of the DOE. And Chancellor, I know probably there's not a typical day, but how does your day look like? 
Well, it's, it's, they're always long uh, and weekends are long as well. But I'll tell you today. So this morning I was up at 4 a.m. Uh, by 4.15 I was out running because mm -hmm. I'm training for a half marathon. Okay. Uh, and then I was picked up uh, at 6.30 this morning. I had, my first media, I, I had my first event. I was on camera in a TV studio with a student and their parent uh, giving out a pre-K offer letter mm -hmm. for them and then being interviewed. From there I went to a meeting with a couple of uh, business uh, executives because we're trying to solidify a partnership. Uh, and then from there, I went to a meeting with the mayor, um, a weekly meeting I have with the mayor. Uh, so we discussed a lot of policy issues. After that, um, I went right into a briefing with uh, one of my deputy chancellors on their body of work. Uh, and then I had another meeting with a group of uh, community-based activists around uh, an issue in, in the community. I took 10 minutes to grab a quick something to eat. Uh, then I had another briefing with another deputy chancellor. Uh, I'm doing this interview now. Uh, from here, I have another meeting with another deputy chancellor. Uh, and then I have a two-hour session with a group of students from across the city uh, where we're going to be talking about a leadership uh, program that they participated in uh, a few months ago. Uh, and then from there, I go to a community meeting uh, this evening. And then I end my evening with one more quick appearance at a, at a community event. So I'll, I'll get home tonight uh, probably. I left my house this morning at 6.30, and I'll get home tonight close to 8.30 in the evening. Pretty typical day. Yes, a long day. And so I see that you're really in different uh, areas in the city also. And we also know that you were very successful in bringing different stakeholders when you were in, was it in San Francisco? San Francisco. And is that a model that actually would work here in New York City? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about New York City and the rich business community we have in, in uh, New York City and the different kinds of businesses, we have financial, we have uh, biomedical, we have uh, software, we have technology, we have you name it, we have it in New York City. Uh, so the work that I've been able to do as a system leader, as a public education leader, is really paint the picture and create the opportunity for the business community to see how they can invest in uh, programs, in programming, uh, so that uh, the, the public school systems are able to get better programs for students, mm -hmm. but they also feed into what happens in the community so that businesses are creating their future employees as well. Uh, so the only way to do that is to be open and to be willing to sit with the business community and help paint the picture of how they can create those kinds of partnerships. Hence, my meeting this morning at 7 a.m. Uh, for some cafecito and converse, conversation with some business executives. That's a model that can work. And in San Francisco, we took on some really weighty things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think we can bring here as well is that instead of me driving that as a superintendent, once we pay, once we pick and we paint the picture, uh, we empowered our principals in San Francisco to be the leaders in those conversations with the tech industry. And because the principals were able to lead the conversation, the business community was able to see how their investment would directly support the work that was happening in the schools. And because of that, they were willing to invest more and over a longer period of time. Uh, I see many similar things happening here in New York City. Vamos empezando, it's the first year, but we're already having Having some success with people that are interested and some business colleagues that are interested in doing that kind of programming here in, in New York. That's great. And so we talked a little bit about the challenges um, and I see you th you're very optimistic also about the future. How do you see the future for um, New York City children, uh, Latinos, Mexican and everybody in general? Well it's 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 I think it's bright and uh, the the, the charge, el cargo que tengo todos los días, the thing that I bring with me every single day to, to work is that the decisions that I make that help to uh, make the conditions for the future, for the success of our community, uh, are all predicated on decisions I make right now. So because of that, you know, sometimes uh, I get accused of being a little too blunt in how I talk about issues, um, but I just don't think we have time to um, dance around the issues. We don't have time to uh, circumvent the hard issues that we have in our community. And I think it's important that, you know, I, I have a certain lived experience. Uh, I have been 
uh, a Latino Mexicano uh, living in the United States of America for, for my entire life. So I live like this and I have a certain history and certain things that have happened to me that happened to others. Mm -hmm. So I think I should bring that with me as I uh, take this role. And I've been very upfront and, and, and transparent about that. And I think that that has connected with many people in the community. Uh, but I think it's also made some folks uncomfortable, not that that's what I want, mm -hmm. but I think we have to keep the conversations real and transparent. And is there a specific issue that you would like to highlight right now uh, for our viewers? Yeah, I think the very fact that uh, not all of our students have access to all of the opportunities in our school system, that there are a series of screens in getting into certain schools and certain programs, that there hasn't been an investment in all of our communities historically, um, that uh, communities have been um, not through commission, but perhaps omission, pitted against each other. Uh, those are all issues of equity and lack of equity. And I think that uh, those are the kinds of things that as a system leader, uh, I want to take on. Uh, and, and you know, I like to say to folks uh, two things in, in Spanish. Uh, one of them is, uh, no soy monedita de oro para caerle bien a todos. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a little gold coin and everybody's gonna love me. So I'm gonna say what I gotta say. And the, and the other thing is, is that I think is really important is que there's no time like the present. No hay tiempo como el presente. Mm -hmm. So those two things really drive these difficult issues. And I think that the community needs to have a voice. And I'm really proud of our Spanish speaking, Mexican, pero Latino community in New York City that are really starting to lift their voices. Yes. Que bueno. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you so much for opening the doors of this beautiful building. And is there a place where we can find everything that uh, the DOE is doing, a website, a social media handle? Sure, so uh, we have our website, www.schools.nyc.gov. Uh, you can go on there and that's our website. It's easy to navigate and it's navigatable in multiple languages. And then if anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, uh, my handle is at D-O-E Chancellor. Uh, and that's my Twitter handle. You can follow what happens because I tweet regularly and uh, you know they can also share stuff that's happening. We also have a New York Schools uh, Twitter account, at NY Schools uh, in, in public schools. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's on the website as well, so tuiteenme, por favor. Great. Chancel Carranza, thank you so much for, for opening again uh, your life story and sharing this specifically to the Mexican community. Thank you so much. Gracias. Adelante. And thank you all for joining us for one more episode of the Mexican Studies Oral History Project. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Our handle is at CUNYMSI. We wish you enjoyed this conversation with Chancellor Carranza as much as we did and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Mexican Studies Oral History Project.